Hello, welcome back to lecture number 84. This is 8.10, the African American Civil Rights Movement, 1960s and beyond. We have two learning objectives and two themes. So the themes are social structures and politics and power. With our first learning objective, we're going to talk about how and why various groups responded to calls for the expansion of civil rights from 1960 to 1980. And we begin with Martin Luther King Jr. During and after World War II, civil rights activists, activists and leaders, most notably Martin Luther King Jr., combated racial discrimination utilizing a variety of strategies, including legal challenges, direct action, and nonviolent protest tactics. So we've already seen Jr., Martin Luther King Jr. in the 1954 Montgomery bus boycotts, being active there. And he will continue to be active in the movement going from southern city to southern city, wherever he is called upon and needed to organize people and fight injustices and civil rights. In one of these stops in Birmingham, Alabama, he is arrested for supposedly uh, doing a march without a proper permit. And while he is in jail in Birmingham, he writes a letter from a Birmingham jail and it inspires action from the government. Letter from the Birmingham jail is the document in which he says that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, while he was a civil rights leader from 1963 to 1968, he was being investigated by the FBI. He was seen as a threat. There were allegations that he was a communist um, because of his involvement in the civil rights movement. And after he helps inspire the government to pass legislation in the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, he continues to be active across the South. Uh, he publishes the book, Where Do We Go From Here? Again, kind of answering the hypothetical question of now that we have um, legal protections by the law, how are we going to help the black uh, community in America progress further and get the equality that has been for so long been kept from them. So he's advocating for greater measures, um, so looking for universal basic income and things that we would call today um, uh, affirmative action um, is what he would be looking for. Uh, as far as direct action and nonviolent protest tactics, this was common across the entire civil rights movement. This wasn't just something that Martin Luther King Jr. advocated. There were sit-ins at segregated lunch counters. You can see a picture of it on the right side. Uh, there were freedom rides, so uh, black and white students would get on a Greyhound bus in the north and would ride down into southern cities trying to get uh, local law enforcement to uphold the law and the recent Supreme Court cases that said that there should not be segregation in any interstate commerce or interstate transportation. And then finally, with the 1963 March on Washington, about 200,000 Americans, black and white, go to Washington, D.C. to advocate for um, greater access to economic opportunities for black Americans. And you see in the top right the picture of the leaders of the civil rights movement. And at the very center on the bottom is A. Philip Randolph. So he's actually seen as the most important figure in the 1963 Civil Rights March because it was his original vision during the Roosevelt administration to bring this together. And obviously you have King next to him. Other leaders that we talked about in the previous lecture like Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, John Lewis finally makes his appearance because his group SNCC or the uh, Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee is now very active. John Lewis is going to be the youngest of these leaders to speak at the march and because um, of the nature of his group and his age, he's also going to be quite a lot more radical in asking for more um, radical things at a faster pace. All right, so continuing resistance, slowed efforts at desegregation, sparking social and political unrest across the nation, debates among civil rights activists over the efficacy of nonviolence increased after 1965. So uh, after we get all of these advancements and, um, and Supreme Court cases guaranteeing desegregated education, we start putting that to the test. And in 1962, a former U.S. 
Air Force veteran James Meredith is trying to attend the University of Mississippi, and he is being blocked from entering and registering. So the Kennedy administration is going to send U.S. Marshals to ensure that he's able to get there and to, to register. In 1963, Governor George Wallace is going to block the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama, trying to get, trying to keep African American students from registering. And again, the Kennedy administration is sending in the Justice Department to ensure that the students are able to register. Eventually, Wallace also backs down. But these resistance to the civil rights movement uh, continued and escalated into violent acts. We see the assassination of Medgar Evers, who was a civil rights activist in Mississippi, who is shot outside of his home after arriving uh, from a late night of working at the NAACP offices. You see the rifle that took Medgar Evers' life. And then in 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. is also assassinated on April 4th, 1968. Um, before the night before he was assassinated, he was speaking to a crowd and he was talking about the threats on his life up until this point and how um, he was willing to do everything for the cause and that he very accurately predicted that he may not be able to see all of the gains of the work that they are doing. I've included the last paragraph of his last speech, the I've been to the mountaintop speech, and you'll see that he's very uh, aware of the danger of his position. He says, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that as we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. So those were his last words in public before he's assassinated the next day. And... Um, then in the 1968 presidential election, we see again even more of this backlash against the civil rights movement uh, in the form of the candidacy of George Wallace, the same George Wallace that stood at the front of the University of Alabama to keep black students from registering. He runs for president as a third party under the American Independent Party, and he receives 46 electoral votes all coming from the Deep South. So it shows that the Americans are still not quite ready to accept this new wave of equality that should be coming from the civil rights movement. And so as part of that, the, 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 the backlash, there is the debate within the civil rights movement about what's the best way forward. Up until this point, peaceful protest has been the, the way forward. And we see that even with in the 1960s with the creation of the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. So Ella Baker, John Lewis, Stockley Carmichael, they are the main figures inside of SNCC. Stockley Carmichael is credited with creating the Black Power Movement. And we also have um, advocates of using uh, violence in self-defense against white violence. So Malcolm X, very famously seen as someone who was advocating for part, part of the 1960s, before he died, or before he was assassinated, he began to change his ideology to be more peaceful. The Black Panthers were a militant revolutionary socialist group, and they were advocating self-rule and black separatism. And we see also race riots across America in response to racism and segregation, and also um, against the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. For example, the Watts riots of 1968 uh, were uh, erupted after an African-American was um, being pulled over and the cop um, was ended up beating someone, a bystander, who was uh, trying to protest against the arrest that was going on. All right, our second learning objective. Explain the various ways in which the federal government responded to the calls for the expansion of civil rights. And this is the part of the Great Society that's going to deal with racial issues. The three branches of the federal government use measures, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964, to promote greater racial equality. 
This act made segregation in public facilities illegal. That's bus stops, restaurants, hotels, and it's going to give the government more power to enforce these policies. It also creates the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is going to monitor discrimination in employment. It's going to allow employees to file grievances for being discriminated against in the workplace. In 1965, we passed the Voting Rights Act, and it's going to eliminate literacy tests, and it's going to give power to the Justice Department to step in and register African Americans who have been living in areas where their uh, vote or their power of voting has been suppressed. This is inspired by the police violence on the peaceful protesters at the Selma March. So these protesters uh, that were being led by Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis were uh, doing a 54-mile march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama, the state capital. Uh, and they were met very early on in their march with violence by the police officers there. We also passed the 24th Amendment, or ratify it, in 1964, which eliminates the poll tax. That was another tool that was being used to disenfranchise black voters. And then a series of Supreme Court decisions expanded civil rights and individual liberties. Here's a long list of cases. Baker versus Carr ends gerrymandering on the basis of race. Gerrymandering is the practice of drawing representative districts to benefit one party over the other. Green versus New Kent County in 1968 said that using school choice programs was not sufficient enough to comply with desegregation orders, that school districts needed to be more active in providing options to black students to be able to uh, attend white schools or previously white majority schools. Um, Alexander versus Holmes County, this is probably the most significant court case in this list because in 1969, 15 years after Brown, the Supreme Court says that enough is enough. So much time has, been, has passed by and there's still not uh, the degree of integration in schools that they had hoped for by this point. And so they are calling for an immediate desegregation of the nation's schools to happen in the upcoming school year. Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg allows for the use of busing for desegregation. And then in 1974, we again begin to see a backlash and a reversal in policy with Milliken versus Bradley, which prohibits the use of interdistrict busing as a tool for desegregation. So we start to see that there is going to be a slowing in progress of um, desegregation in schools starting in 1974. <clears throat> All right, so that's it. Here's our recap. Martin Luther King Jr. was the most visible civil rights leader. Uh, he inspired through the letter from a Birmingham jail and his I Have a Dream speech from the 1963 Civil Rights March. There was resistance to progress. It coincided with uh, a variety of groups like SNCC and the Black Panther Party uh, arrival and the legislative victories for the movement with civil with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we also see some judicial victories with Alexander versus Holmes uh, County and Baker versus Carr. So thank you again for watching this lecture and please be sure to come back for lecture number 85. Thank you.